All right, so we're diving into ARG today. Uh, yeah. Retrieval augmented generation. Okay. And uh, we've got a ton to unpack. You've so. given us everything from like the 101 yeah. to some really complex stuff and a real world case study, which I always love to see. Well, and, and what I think is so cool about RAG is that it really is like we're giving these language models, oh, yeah. you know, the, the engines behind so much of what we think of as AI. It's like we're giving them keys to the library. Okay. You know, they have access to this incredible wealth of information that they can then use to answer questions in a whole new way. So for our listeners who haven't really uh, gotten their hands dirty with ARG yet, yeah. what are we talking about here? Give me the, the quick rundown. So imagine you have a question. Okay. Right. That's your query. Okay. The ARG system then goes out to a database. Yeah. And finds the most relevant information. Kind of like a super powered search engine. Right. But here's where it gets really interesting. It doesn't just give you back a link. Okay. It takes that information and uses it to generate a unique response. So it's like having a personal researcher who's both finding the information and then summarizing it for me in a way that makes sense. Exactly. You like it. Yep. Exactly. And then it gets even more interesting when we start adding in these advanced techniques. Okay. Let's talk about that leveling up because our sources mention query enhancement, re-ranking, and validation. Yeah. It sounds a bit like we're training our Argi system to be a detective. That's a great analogy. Right. Because think about it. Yeah. A really good detective doesn't just go out and collect every piece of information. Right. They're very targeted. So it starts with asking the right questions, and then it's about sifting through the evidence, right? Finding those key pieces of information, and then it's that final check, making sure that you've got the right suspect. Yeah, so I guess query enhancement would be like making sure our detective is asking the right questions in the first place. Exactly. Yeah. It's about taking that initial question and refining it, maybe adding some context or clarifying any ambiguous terms. So we're we're giving the system the best chance of finding what we're really looking for. And then re-ranking comes in, and that's where we decide what's important and what are the red herrings. Exactly. Not all information is created equal right. Right. So we want to make sure that the most relevant and the most reliable information is rising to the top. Okay. And then finally, we've got validation. Yeah. Which is that final check. Right. We want to be accurate. We want to be trustworthy. So we need to build in those mechanisms that double check the information, make sure it's solid before we present it. So this is all really interesting stuff. But then our notes move into a real world ROG system, which I think is really cool to see in action. Yeah. And this one is called Wanbot. Wanbot. Yeah. And what's interesting to me is that it's open source. So anybody listening can actually go and look at the code themselves, which I love that transparency. Transparency is so key. And it's a great example of ROG in action. Mm. And I think it highlights a really important principle here, which is that you don't always have to reinvent the wheel. Okay. You know, the team behind Wanbot, they really focused on the 80-20 rule. Okay, so I've heard that term thrown around, but how does it apply to building an AI system, because that's not something that most people would think about in their day-to-day -day lives. It's all about efficiency and impact. Okay. Right. So they realized that by focusing on the 20% of user needs that came up most frequently, they could solve 80% of the problems. Okay. It's about getting the most bang for your buck. That makes a ton of sense. Like yeah. just focusing your efforts in the places that are really going to move the needle. Exactly. But I mean, Obviously, any kind of AI system, even if you're being strategic with it, it can't be a walk in the park. Right. So what were some of the challenges that they had overcome? Well, one of the things that they focused on a lot was accuracy. Okay. Right. Because this is a system that's providing information. So you want to make sure that it's reliable and trustworthy. Right. So they really honed in on making sure the information was up to date, providing citations so you knew where the information yeah. was coming from. And even building in a way for users to flag anything that they found that might be inaccurate. So it's about having that human touch and acknowledging that AI isn't perfect. Exactly. At least not yet. Yeah. And they were also very conscientious of user privacy. Okay. You know, they made a point of anonymizing the data to protect any sensitive information. Yeah. It's about building trust with your users. That actually makes me think about that initial stage of data ingestion. Yeah. Because if you don't have a good foundation. It's like building a house on sand, right? Exactly. If you don't get that right, yeah. everything else is going to suffer. So let's talk about that next. Yeah. Because we've, we've kind of laid the groundwork here. But now I kind of want to get into the nitty gritty let's do of here. how we do that. Yeah, data ingestion. <laughs> more exciting than it sounds. That's what we're all about here, the deep dive. It's all about those unexpected aha moments. Mm -hmm. So how do we make sure we're not just 
you know, throwing a bunch of information into a system and hoping for the best. Right. It's not about just randomly dumping data into our our ag system. Right. We have to be a little more strategic about it. Okay. Think of it like building a library. Okay. Right. We don't just take books and throw them on shelves. Right. There's a system. There's a method to the madness. Yeah. My bookshelves at home might disagree with that statement, but uh, go on. Well, hopefully our, our ag system is a little more organized than our personal bookshelves. Okay. So what's the method? So our sources break it down into three main steps. Yep. We have data parsing, chunking, and then metadata management. Okay, let's break those down. So data parsing, I'm imagining this is where we make sure that everything is speaking the same language. Yeah, it's like translating for the AI world. Okay. Right? We might have information coming from all sorts of places, PDFs, websites, code repositories, Mm. and it can all be structured in different ways. Yeah. So data parsing is about standardizing that information translating it into a format that our AI can actually understand. So it's like making sure that everyone at the UN has a working translator headset. I like that analogy. Right. It's about removing those barriers so the AI can actually focus on understanding the content itself. Okay. And then we've got chunking, Chunking. which sounds like taking these massive walls of text and breaking them down into bite-sized pieces. Exactly. Think about trying to eat an entire cake in one bite. Yeah. It's not going to go well. It's overwhelming. It's messy. Right. Chunking is about creating those manageable pieces of information. So how do we decide where to make those cuts? So there are different approaches. There's fixed length chunking, semantic chunk, a content-based chunking. Okay. It really depends on the type of data we're dealing with and what we're trying to achieve. I noticed in the notes on Wanbot, they actually talked about using a two-pronged approach yeah. where they use both semantic and structural chunking. And that's a great example of how you can tailor your approach for different types of content. Okay. So for general text, semantic chunking might make the most sense because you want to preserve the flow of ideas. Right. But if you're dealing with something like code, okay, you might want to keep related functions together, even if it means varying the chunk size. So it's recognizing that you chunk a recipe differently than you chunk a novel. Exactly. Context is key. Right. And the right chunking method ensures that the AI isn't missing those crucial connections. And that brings us, I guess, to that final stage of data ingestion, which is metadata management. Metadata management. And this is where we get to play librarian a little bit. Exactly. Right. This is where we're adding all those labels and tags to make everything easily searchable. It's like the card catalog system of our library. Okay. Right. It's all that extra information, the author, the subject, the date keywords that help us find exactly what we're looking for. And I'm assuming this is even more important for an AI because it can't just browse the shelves like I can. Exactly. It doesn't have that same ability to make those connections on the fly. Right. So by providing this rich metadata, we're giving it those extra clues. It's like saying, hey, this information comes from a peer-reviewed scientific journal. Okay. Or this piece of code is relevant to version 3.2 of the software. Gotcha. We're adding those layers of context and credibility. So we've organized everything. We've made it nice and searchable. We can find what we're looking for, hopefully. Yeah. But how do we make sure the AI actually understands what we're asking? Right. It's one thing to have a well-organized library. Right. It's another to have a skilled librarian who can interpret your requests. Okay. And that's where query enhancement comes in. All right. So this is where things get really interesting because we're going beyond just keywords here. Starting to get into the nuance of language. Yeah. It's about bridging that gap between what we say and what we mean. Okay. So our sources mention four essential techniques for this conversation, history, intent recognition, keyword enhancement, and query decomposition. Okay. So let's start with conversation history because I feel like this is something that's really important to us as humans. It is. But we don't often think about AI needing to have that same capacity. Yeah. Have you ever had a conversation with someone where they just kept asking you the same question over and over again? Oh, yeah. All the time. Like they weren't even listening. Yeah. That's not a good feeling. No. So with the conversation history, our our RAG system can actually keep track of those previous interactions and use that context to provide more relevant responses. That makes sense. It's like having an AI with a good memory. Okay. It remembers your preferences. It remembers what you've talked about before. And I would imagine that's really helpful for navigating complex topics where you might have a series of questions. Absolutely. Where you're building on that information. It's about creating a more natural flow. Okay. And then we have intent recognition. Okay. Which is all about understanding the why behind the question. 
So not just the words themselves, but what I'm actually trying to accomplish with my question. Exactly. Two people could ask the same question two completely different ways. Right. And a good R guest system with intent recognition can cut through those variations to get to the heart of what they're really looking for. It's like knowing that someone asking for a map might actually be looking for directions to the nearest coffee shop. Right, or the best coffee shop. Exactly. Okay, that makes a lot of sense. And then we have keyword enhancement, which feels a bit more straightforward. Yeah, this one's a little more about giving the AI a helping hand. Okay. It's like taking those initial search terms and adding a few strategic spices mm -hmm. to create a more flavorful and effective query. So it's like knowing that if I add vegan and gluten-free to my search for chocolate chip cookies, yeah. I'm going to get much more targeted results. Oh, exactly. Okay. We're giving it those extra clues yeah. to navigate that vast sea of information. And then finally, we have query decomposition, which sounds like it was designed for me because I tend to ask long, rambling questions. Don't worry. We've all been there. So this is like taking that big, messy question and breaking it down into manageable chunks. Exactly. It's like disassembling a piece of furniture. Okay. Before you try to move it through a narrow doorway. Right. You break it down into smaller pieces. Okay. And then you can reassemble it once it's in the right place. So by separating out those different parts. Yeah. The AI can actually wrap its head around it a little bit better. Exactly. And avoid getting tripped up. So we've talked about asking the right questions, making sure that AI understands those questions. Mm -hmm. But I feel like now we're at the point where we actually need to find the answers. Right. We've got to retrieve some information. Yeah. So let's talk about retrieval and re-ranking. Okay. Because it's not enough to just find an answer. It's got to be the right answer. The best answer. It's like we're trying to find a needle in a haystack. Yeah. And not just any needle, right? Yeah. It's got to be the right one. Exactly. The one that's actually going to be useful. So how do we make sure we're finding that needle and not just getting stuck with a bunch of hay? So that's where this idea of re-ranking comes in. Okay. It's about taking those initial results and then prioritizing the most promising ones. Okay. So it's like we have a team of research assistants who are going through and highlighting the things that we should probably pay attention to. Exactly. It's like that scene in a movie where they spread all the evidence out on a big table. Right. And they start connecting the dots. Yeah. And we have all these different tools that we can use to do that. Our sources talk about things like query translation and metadata filtering, okay. even something called context stuffing. Mm. Sounds a little technical. It does. But the core idea is that we're being smart about how we narrow down those options. Okay, so we're going beyond just those basic keyword matches and right. actually using all that context that we talked about. Exactly. We're using the metadata. Yeah. All those labels and tags that we talked about in data ingestion. Right. Become really valuable here. So give me an example because I'm a little lost. Okay. So let's say we're asking about a specific software bug. Yeah. With metadata filtering, we can tell our RAG system. Okay. Okay. Only show me results from bug reports. Gotcha. Forum discussions. Yeah. Code commits. So we're instantly narrowing down the search. Exactly. To so something that's actually going to be helpful. We're going to the right section of the library instead of just wandering around aimlessly. Okay. I like it. Okay, and I imagine that we can even combine these different techniques to be even more effective. Absolutely. It's not always an either-or situation. Right. Sometimes the best approach is to use them together. So we might start with that broad keyword search. Right. And then we might use metadata filtering to narrow it down. And then maybe we use context stuffing yeah. to bring in some additional information that might be relevant. So it's really about understanding all the tools that are available yeah. and then becoming like a master crafts person and picking the right one for the job. Exactly. Okay, so we've, we've retrieved the information, mm -hmm. but I feel like the last piece of this puzzle is actually making that information digestible because what good is all this data if we can't make sense of it? Right, it's like having all the ingredients for an amazing cake. But if you don't know how to bake... You're not going to end up with a cake. You're going to have a mess. Okay, so this is, I guess, the response synthesis stage. Response synthesis, exactly. Where we're taking all this raw data yeah. and turning it into something that's actually meaningful. We're taking those carefully selected pieces of information yeah. and we're weaving them together into something coherent, something informative. Okay, and this is where I imagine these large language models that we hear so much about. LLMs. LLMs. This is where they really come into play, right? Exactly. These are the AI systems that can actually generate text that sounds like a human wrote it. Okay, but even the most advanced chef needs a recipe. Exactly. They need instructions. Okay. And that's where prompting comes in. Okay, I've heard that term prompt engineering thrown around a lot.
Yeah. It's a hot topic these days. What is it? It's essentially about crafting those instructions for the LLM. Okay. It's about telling it how we wanted to use that information that we've so carefully retrieved. Okay. It's the difference between just saying, make me a cake. Right. And providing a detailed recipe with all the measurements and the steps. So the prompt itself can actually influence how good the output is. Absolutely. Okay. And our notes mention this really interesting technique called few shot learning. Yeah, few shot learning is really cool. It sounds like we're showing the AI how it's done. Exactly. It's like we're giving it a crash course in good writing. Okay. We're providing the LLM with a few examples of good responses. Okay. It's like if you were teaching someone how to paint. Right. You might show them some examples of different styles and techniques. Yeah, just to kind of give them a sense of what you're looking for. Exactly. And it can make a huge difference. So we're not just crossing our fingers and hoping for the best. Right. We're actually giving the AI the tools to succeed. Precisely. And the results can be really impressive. This has been fascinating. I feel like we've covered so much ground. Yeah. But I also can't help but think about that question of trust. Yeah. Because with all this talk of AI, it's easy to get caught up in what's possible and forget about making sure that these systems are actually reliable. Right. It's easy to get seduced by something that sounds really smart. Exactly. Yeah. So how do we build in those safeguards? How do we make sure that we can actually trust these systems? So that's where we get into things like guardrails, grounding, and citations. Okay, let's break those down. Guardrails sound like we're putting up some safety barriers. Exactly. We want to prevent the AI from going off the rails. Right. So we're talking about content moderation, okay. fact-checking ethical guidelines. Yeah. We want to make sure that this technology is used for good. Okay, and what about grounding? That sounds like we're keeping our AI tethered to reality. Exactly. Because one of the things that LLMs can sometimes do is hallucinate. Which sounds a little scary. It can be. Mm -hmm. They can generate responses that sound really plausible, but they're completely made up. Okay, so they're being a little too creative. Exactly. All right. So grounding is all about making sure that every claim, every piece of information is actually backed up by a reliable source. So it's like giving our AI a healthy dose of skepticism. Exactly. Don't believe everything you think. Yeah. Check your sources. I like it. And then citations kind of feel self-explanatory, but it's important nonetheless. Yeah, absolutely. Mm -hmm. Just like in academia, we need to give credit where credit is due. Yeah. And it also allows users to go back and look at the source material for themselves. It's like having that paper trail to back everything up. Exactly. This has been amazing, I have to say. It's been a journey. It has been a journey. We've gone from those initial queries to these, you know, very sophisticated response synthesis techniques and everything in between. This whole new world. It really is. And I think what's so important for our listeners to take away from this is that you don't have to be an AI engineer to understand these concepts. Right. And I think having this basic understanding allows us to be more informed consumers of information. Exactly. It allows you to ask better questions. Yeah. To spot potential biases. Right. And to really think critically about the information that you're seeing online. So much of our world is driven by these systems now. It is. That having even just a basic understanding, I think, is so empowering. Absolutely. Knowledge is power. Well said. This has been fantastic. Thank you so much for joining me on this deep dive into RAG. It's been my pleasure. And to our listeners out there, keep asking those questions, and we'll see you next time on The Deep Dive.